Okay, so I'm not used to preaching up here. This is all pretty, you know. I need space away from you all. <laughs> Let's see here. Two ways street. There we go. Is that it? Okay. Yeah, two ways so, street. <laughs> it's a two ways street. I remember when we first uh, set up the old uh, the old church. Well, that, that shows you how long we've been doing this. Uh, Baron said, "You got to move the front rows back because." <laughs> You loom over them and then you might spit on us. <laughs> it's, it's very scary. You know, so, sorry, Dave. So, so, so anyway, uh, so I missed last week. Sorry, um, Eileen and David and I zipped down to uh, Redding, California, the redneck capital of the West Coast. And, uh, that's where her sister uh, lives in a trailer park and her brother lives in a different trailer park. So we were, you know. Trailer trash. Oh, okay. Trailer trash. Okay, we just said, okay, right there, trailer trash. But anyway, so we're sitting at Lulu's Diner. I gotta tell you, uh, the cafe, and uh, having lunch with everybody and having a nice time. And I noticed there's a picture uh, behind my head uh, in the booth. So I called the waitress over and goes, So, what are these pictures? She goes, You're obviously not from around here. <laughs> <laughs> well, my hair came out of a red neck. You know? <laughs> so anyway, but, uh, so I said, No, I'm not. And she goes, you're sitting where the troubadour sits. And I go, I'm not around her. I said, I don't know what you're talking about. You're in Merle Haggard's booth. <laughs> Show some respect. <laughs> <laughs> Evidently, he lives in Red he lived in Reading until last year, and he always stayed every day at uh, Lulu's and held court there with Willie and stuff. <laughs> so, anyway, that has nothing to do with the sermon, okay? I just wanted to have a meal last weekend. So, phew, that's a relief. <laughs> anyway. Merle Haggard's booth, that's pretty cool. That's cool. Is this on the test? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, last week, um, Chris started us off on this new series, uh, Lessons from Nehemiah. And uh, um, uh, now I tell you, I, I, I wasn't here, so I'm totally afraid that I'm going to just go step for step down through what he just said last week. So <laughs> forgive me in advance if I do, although somebody told me we could do the exact same sermon word for word and it would sound different. <laughs> I don't know. But um, I want to talk about Nehemiah. Uh, it's, to me, it's an exceptional part of the Bible because um, it has to do uh, with um, how do you make a difference in the world and how do you, how do you allow the people around you to make a difference in their world. Um, and so, uh, and, and when I was young, I, I need to tell you this, when I was young, I, I preached on this once, and I had like uh, all the lessons we can learn from this on how to do a fundraising building program for a church. <laughs> We're building the, you know, and, uh, and, and it worked. It, it really did. You know, I think we raised some money there. And, uh, and now I'm at this point in my life and going, this isn't about building the church. This is about building the church. This is about building people. And what happens when uh, we see the wreckage in the lives around us and the damage that's been done and the foundation's crumbling, how do we respond to that and how do we let God use us to um, encourage, um, strengthen, and rebuild people? And, and that, to me, is, is worthy. Uh, raising money for a building program is not that worthy. Um, now, um, in chapter 2, Nehemiah arrives in Jerusalem. And, and Chris told you last week how you know, he got word that, that his hometown, Jerusalem, was in disarray. The walls were crumbling and the foundation, everything was bad. The people were discouraged. They were under attack. Everything was bad. And he went into kind of a grieving depression. And uh, he was working for the king as the poison taster of the wine, you know, which is not a long-term job. But um, <laughs> uh, King Artaxerxes, in, in which is what we consider Iran. He was the king of Iran, basically, in those days. And... Uh, and the king responds in such a great way. You know, he, uh, he asks some questions. Uh, why are you depressed? Which is a great question to ask anybody. Um, and then he asked him, uh, what do you need? And then he asked him, what do you want from me? And that began this whole series of, uh, you know, all I need is time. I need some time off work. And the king goes, okay, how much? I just wanted time, you know. And then, uh, well... You know, I could use some wood to rebuild the entire walls of Jerusalem. 
So the king goes, okay, great. Raid the royal forest. You got that. And then he says, well, you know, the king, what I really need is influence. You know, how about you loan me a reputation? So the king writes letters of recommendation so he could travel freely and be safe and everything. And then the king, without being asked, throws in an army. <laughs> so you might as well have people travel with you and could help and could haul all this wood. So uh, we'll give you a cavalry and generals and all that stuff. And so off Nehemiah goes to his hometown to rebuild. Now, if I was him, just saying, okay, if I was him and I was coming with an army and generals and a truckload of wood, and, uh, and the personal letters from the king of Iran telling everybody to leave me alone, um, I'd make a pretty cool entrance, I think. <laughs> you know, I'd come in and, uh, hey, I'm here. <laughs> you know, settle quietly, but I'm here and I'm here to fix you all. <laughs> you know, really. Uh, but Nehemiah doesn't do this. Um, he does something that's that's very unusual. Like in our culture, you know, we're filled with brashness and promises and big things. He came in and did something really different. And uh, I first learned about this technique um, uh, back years years ago when we uh, did the book uh, Building Strong People. Um, there was a there was a writer at the time named Clifford Pinchot III, which. You gotta have a family money to have a name like that. <laughs> anyway, he wrote, he wrote a book called Entrepreneurial on how to start things in an existing organization. And and the thing he said is, if you're gonna succeed in an existing organization, whether it be a, a company or a church or something like that, he said what you have to do to succeed is submarine. And I looked at that and thought, what is he talking about? And he said, you know. If you're working in a job and you come up with some great ideas to how to change things, and you announce them, here's what we're going to do, here's the new plan, you get blown right out of the water. You have no hope. So he says, submarine as long as possible. Stay below the surface and take your time, and then at the right time you'll know when to surface. That's what Nehemiah did. He comes into Jerusalem, doesn't make a big announcement. He has all the resources of the world. He has a plan, he has a dream, he has all these things. And then he quietly goes out at night with a couple of friends and surveys the situation. And that's where our scripture starts for today. Um, I went to Jerusalem, uh, this is uh, chapter two, verse 11. I went to Jerusalem after staying there three days I set out during the night with a few men. I had not told anyone what my God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. There were no horses with me except the one I was riding on. And by night, I went through the valley gate, toward the jackal gate and the dung gate, where you don't want to go there without a horse, <laughs> examining the walls of Jerusalem, which had been broken down, and the gates, which had been destroyed by fire. Then I moved on to the uh, fountain gate and the king's pool, and there was not enough room even for my horse to get through. And I went up the valley by night, examining the wall. Finally, I turned back and re-entered through the valley gate. The officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing, because as yet I had said nothing to the Jews or the priests or the nobles or the officials or any others who would be doing the work. Then I said to them, you, you see the trouble that we're in. Jerusalem lies in ruins. Its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of God upon me and what the king had said to me. And they replied, let us start rebuilding. So they began this good work. Now, when you look at this, Imagine the defensiveness of these people, even though their lives were burned out, their homes were ruined, uh, they were disarrayed, they were easily threatened and defeated. You'd think they would want a conquering hero to come in and say, move aside people, I'm taking Kilber. I'm gonna do this, look what I can do. But that didn't happen. Instead, he just quietly went about, examined it, got a clear view of what was going on, what had happened, and then he comes to them and I love this. He says, you know the problem. You already know it. Now think about that when we're dealing with folks. 
Anybody here ever have a, an issue or a problem to deal with? <laughs> Nobody. Okay, well, good. <laughs> Fred and I will just talk to each other. <laughs> no. So, you know, the thing is, when, when, we're, when we've got stuff, we don't really respond well to someone coming in and say, let me fix you. I know what you need. I know what your problem is, and this is what you need to do. You ever respond well to that? Not really. I mean, you don't really know me. You don't know what I need. You don't know what's going to, and besides, who are you? You're a mess. You know, I mean, just say it figuratively. <laughs> <laughs> Not making eye contact with anyone. So Nehemiah does this brilliant thing of just saying to them, you already know what the problem is. You know. I don't have to tell you. But we could do something about it. And in case you're wondering how, let me tell you what God's given us. We've got resources, we have people, we have hope, we have influence, we have all of these things uh, that, are, that are here so that we can work on our problem. That is so brilliant. Because it takes away all the defensiveness. Nobody has to be protecting themselves or say, who said my problem worse than yours or anything like that. It's, it's we're sharing in this. What the heck? Let's do this together. You already know what your problem is. And hopefully, if we're vulnerable, you'll know what my problems are. So we'll do it together. Now, when this happened, the people's response, I thought, was also really, really interesting. They didn't say, yeah, we're going to build the wall. Yeah, we're going to make it high. Yeah, we're going to make strong houses. We're going we're gonna to be the centerpiece of everything around here. We're going to get this thing done, which is such an American way of doing it. You know, uh, they didn't do that. You know, what, what was their answer? They replied, let's start. Let's start. That is amazing to me. They're not buying into the whole program. They're not even committing to say it's going to work. They don't even know. Maybe we'll run out of it. Maybe the king shortchanges us on the lumber thing. Who knows? Maybe we're going to have a heart attack and die trying to lift these beams up. And we're not going to live to see it. And our grandchildren have to finish the job. I don't know. Let's start. That is so, so important. You know, I've wasted a lot of my life. I'm going to start as soon as I get this figured out. As soon as I've got everything lined up, as soon as I got everybody on board, as soon as I got everybody on board, as soon as, and of course, as soon as everyone agrees with me that this is how we ought to do it, and it's my way, and we can get all of that, and uh, we count the boards, make sure there's enough. You know, I don't want to seem stupid. And so uh, when we do that, then I'm going to begin. <clears throat> and I am waiting so many projects to start that we've never actually started because I haven't got it all together yet. Um, but they just said, okay, we know what our problem is. Let's start. That could be maybe the most powerful two words we could say today. But what if we don't finish? Doesn't matter. What if it turns out different? What if we start rebuilding something and it changes and becomes different? Doesn't matter. What if we start going one direction and God uh, takes us another direction? Doesn't matter. Let's start. One of my favorite um, theologians um, was um, Harvey McKay. He wrote the book, Beware the Naked Man Who Offers You His Shirt. <laughs> <laughs> he also wrote a business book, uh, uh, swimming, How to Swim with the Sharks and Not Be Eaten Alive. This is, he's like the king of way too long titles. <laughs> anyway, uh, he, he had started out his book, he was talking about, um, you know, how to be a leader in business, you know. 
and, uh, and he had his nice little formula. This was his formula. First, you start with your passion and vision. This could just work like a seminar, you know, work. Uh, passion and vision plus hard work plus follow through equals success. So he publishes this. And he goes on the circuit, speaking to all these business, big businesses. Hey, you have your passion and vision, and then you have your hard work, and you have the follow through, and then you have your success, and everybody pays a big bucks. He said, then I got this letter from a chemistry prof at Harvard who said, I looked at your formula, and you're missing an ingredient. He's like, man, I, I just made a career out of this little formula. <laughs> I'm doing okay with this, you know, don't mess with me, chemistry prof. And, uh, and so the prof said, no, you forgot something. You have to add in plus courage because all your vision, all your passion, all your hard work means absolutely nothing the minute you become afraid. When we get afraid, it's all out the window. Your formula doesn't work. And I thought about that. I thought, you know, that's really true. We get so focused on doing the job or doing the, what we're supposed to do, blah, blah, blah. And we forget the fact that without uh, the Lord giving us courage to stand up against our fears, to address our fears, and to not allow them to dominate us, we've got nothing. Because we get derailed so easily as soon as we're afraid. How do you get over the fear? How do you, how do you fight against the fear? How does your courage show itself? I hate to say this, um, I really hate to say this because that means it's gonna apply to me. Uh, the way to do it is you keep having really scary experiences one after another. That's how you do it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you know, like, I, you know, I'm afraid of heights, you know, so Damien made me go up the top of the Statue of Liberty to the, to the torch. I mean, when he was a kid, they don't allow you to do that anymore because they've gotten really smart. <laughs> Shouldn't put people through that. I'm going up this little uh, circular staircase, is that what they call it? Spiral, spiral staircase thing. No kids here? Oh, no. I was using bad language as I went up the spirals. I was cracking, I can't believe it. I'm just here ring. Biscuits are burning. You know, I'm, I'm doing this as I'm going up, and David's going, Come on, Dad, you're holding up the whole line. Come on, Dad, come on, Dad. And you can't go back down because there's like 200 people beneath you wow. on each step going, Why is that old man holding us up? And I'm Playing for my life in the absolute center of the statue. Where, where am I going to go? It's not like I'm going to be blown away off to see. I mean, I'm in the building and I'm clinging and my hands are sweating and I'm just dying in a pile. And you know what I was done? I was still afraid of heights. Still. And so, maybe it's said, Dad, we're, we're going to have to go up the uh, Eiffel Tower. Well, yeah, because I got on the third floor, there's a restaurant. <laughs> Let's go there. It's just like it. You can look right out at the third floor of all the buildings in Paris. You know? <laughs> Pretty cool, you know? No, Dad, we got to go up it. Now, the way to go up it, they don't have a spiral staircase. They have the equivalent of that as an elevator that's made of rickety aluminum foil pieces put together. <laughs> and it goes, good junk, good junk, good junk. You been in it? <laughs> good joke. I'm not lying. I'm not lying. And all these people are leaning. Oh, 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 you know, and, I, and I'm, I'm in the middle of the crowd trying to hang on to the walls. That is, that's not physically possible. But I'm like, good joke. Good joke. We finally get up to the top. And Damien runs out on the edge and said, look over here, Dad. And I'm clinging back on the pillar by the elevator. No, no, you, you go, you go, boy, you go, you go, you go, come out here and take a picture of me. No, I'll remember this, I, I won't need a picture of you. Got done with that? What about my fear of heights? Still there. But, I learned over time that you don't need to have your fear control you. You can do it anyway. You'll still be afraid, 
We're all going to be afraid. Every time we step out, we're going to be afraid. Sometimes for good reason, sometimes not for good reason. But we don't have to let it control us because what does it say in the... Uh, First Timothy, God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of, of power and love and self-control. <clears throat> we don't have to give in to the fear. We just have to say, let's start. Now in your life, you've got situations, you've got things, you've got disarray, you've got crumbling walls, you've got eroded foundations emotionally, relationally, spiritually, all over the place. You've got screw-ups that have cost you dearly. You've had some major losses. You've got all these things. And what God is asking you to do today is that when you hear his voice to say, okay, let's start. We don't know where it's going to end up. It may not even work. I don't know. But I'm willing to start. That's what happened when Jesus called the first disciples. He said, get out of your boat. Get out of leave the family business. Come follow me. Where? You'll find out. What are we going to do? You'll see. Where are we going to eat? I don't know. You either then get out of the boat and follow me or you don't. Let's start. Let's start. Because God is the one that gives us success. And in case you, don't, you think that everybody's on favor, in favor and everybody's supporting uh, Nehemiah's plan here and everybody's on board, I love this in this book, and you're going to see this as we go through this. There's a couple of jackasses who, uh, and, okay, first of all, no one in all of Jerusalem's name is mentioned. All the supportive people, the leaders, the, the uh, no one is mentioned by name. The good neighbors who are working hard and are faithful and, and contributing to the effort, no names mentioned. Except three people. The crankies. <laughs> the one... Benjamin and Mona, Benjamin and Mona. You're going to see this one. And I mean that biblically. That's the, in the Hebrew. Benjamin and Mona. And, uh, but, when Sanballat the Horonite, you know how they are, <laughs> Tobiah the Ammonite, official, and Geshem, the heir, have heard about it, they mocked and ridiculed us. What is this you're doing? Are you rebelling against the king? Why are you doing that? You guys are crazy. And I realized that all these years I've been a pastor at churches, there's always those three. <laughs> the names might change, you know, the faces, they might, they might not be Horabites or more I don't know, <laughs> Morbites, I don't know. Uh, but the same three people are in every church I've ever been in. It is the weirdest. Anybody here ever been in a church where there's those three people? You know them. Oh my golly. Why are you doing this? This isn't the right thing to do. This is stupid. Yeah. And they mock and they ridicule. And this is how Nehemiah answered. I answered him by saying the God of heaven is going to give us success and we will start rebuilding. But as for you, you have no share in Jerusalem. You don't have any claim or any rights. You got jack, basically. Why? Because you're not willing to say, let's start. Now, it's funny because you think, well, okay, so they're out of the way. You're going to see them all through this narrative. They just keep coming back, keep coming back. They are relentless. As were all the people that I met just liked in the church. <laughs> but um, Nehemiah never gets off track. He goes, you know, you don't belong in this. I'm not listening to you. God said, this is what we're going to do. Let's start. Let's see where it ends up. And, uh, you know, i gotta, I got to thank you all because, you know, this year, we went through all these changes, you know. Well, you're out of your church. We're bulldozing that place, blah, blah, blah. Well, who are we now? And what's going to happen? Um, this is, is this week three that we've been here? I can't believe we found it the third week. I almost drove by again and sneak into Foss next door and kind of circle around. You know, and, but um, we're only here because you said, 
Let's start. Let's do it. Let's start again. Let's start over. Let's start in a new way. Will it be the same? No. But let's start. So I thank you for that. On the other hand, I think we need to understand that Jesus is not done with us. And that's why he invites us to say, let's go. Here we go again. I'm sure you've been going through this. Sure you've had all these problems. Sure you've had all these issues. So sure, you know, your life is in disarray. Will you follow me now? Will you trust me now? And if we say yes, we move out on a great adventure. 